Chapter eighteen of The War Workers by E. M. Delafield. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter eighteen. Captain Trevilian's medical board had passed him fit for active service again, and he made matter of fact announcement of his approaching return to france in the course of that evening do you know when johnny next draft that goes i suppose i rejoin the battalion the day after tomorrow, and it might be any day after that exclamations were left to miss bruce grace and johanna received the news almost in silence and char remained monosyllabic will you smoke in the library john said johanna as she rose from the dining table We'll have coffee in there. We can also talk business, Char, if you want to. Then shall I, said Miss Bruce, looking at Grace and feeling strongly inclined to say, shall we? Joanna laid her hand on the little secretary's shoulder. Of course not, Miss Bruce. You know we count you as one of the family. In the library, a certain tenseness of atmosphere prevailed until Joanna had finally dismissed the coffee equipage and leant back in a great leather armchair under the lamp john next her had taken up his favorite position on the hearthrug and was smoking in meditative silence his eyes now and then seeking grace whose head was bent over a piece of needlework char presumably from force of habit had seated herself at the writing-table and miss bruce took a low chair beside her gazing dumbly from her to Lady Vivian and back again, as though a divided loyalty harassed her thoughts. Char broke the silence. Mother, you spoke about letting this place this afternoon. Is that what you mean to do? No, I only said that it was in my power to let it. But, as a matter of fact, since your Uncle Charles has no wish to make any change until the war is over, he and I have agreed that it had better be made use of he is quite willing that i should do whatever seems best and most necessary miss bruce uttered an exclamation red cross work do you mean char made a movement to check her as though unwilling to let any display of surprise greet joanna's announcement of course she said slowly i could find a hundred uses for a place like plessing from turning it into a hospital onwards the idea had naturally occurred to me before, but as I must say, mother, you've always discouraged any form of patriotic sacrifice by every means in your power, and done everything possible to ignore the very fact of there being a war, it never struck me that you would consent to such a plan. John looked up. It isn't a question of consent, Char. The scheme is Cousin Joanna's, not anyone else's as i have been placed in the position of director of the midland supply depot john char said quietly the voluntary organizations here or whatever kind come under my jurisdiction and i must say char interrupted her mother you may say anything you please but you'll never persuade any of us that you and i could work together comfortably and i haven't any intention of trying the experiment i shall offer this place as a convalescent home to be attached to the military hospital at staffield that will put it altogether outside the jurisdiction of your office it's too far from the station not with a couple of cars and government petrol said john the doctors here are overworked as it is a convalescent home does not need the same amount of medical attendance as a hospital and dr prince is perfectly willing to undertake whatever is necessary but you'll want a staff and at least two trained nurses in the house i have no doubt that they can be obtained char i don't want to vex you and make you feel that i'm acting in opposition to all your own schemes spoke joanna impetuously but really and truly it wouldn't answer if i tried to run things on your lines i must do something and it seems a shame not to use plessing but i had thought of another plan though i know johnny doesn't approve of it no i don't said john stoutly char had colored deeply and her mouth was set she spoke as though with difficulty what is it 
tell her grace you thought of it said lady vivian to make placing the hostel for your staff lady vivian would give them their board and lodging and superintend herself you see it would make an enormous difference if the present hostel which is much too small were free you could make it into an extension of the office which is badly needed the chief drawback of course is the distance but we should have to come in by the nine o'clock train every morning and either bicycle back or come out by the six thirty train they're putting it on again next month you see the days will be getting longer very soon and we've all the spring and summer in front of us i don't think it's practicable trevellyan said nor i echoed miss bruce watching the thundercloud on char's forehead i thought char might prefer it said joanna simply you would keep your own rooms my dear of course and it would be very much more comfortable for all of you than the present arrangement as to the difficulty of getting in and out there's no reason why we shouldn't see what could be done about driving one way i don't know if the petrol ought to be used but there are plenty of farm horses and we could hire a wagonette or something of that sort and what about the nights when we're all kept late or a troop train comes in and the canteen work which is never over before eleven or half past you must give it up lady vivian informed her placidly people can't work half the night as well as all day and i've always thought that you had no business to ask it of your staff that canteen work is very heavy and utterly unfit for girls who've been all day in an office it isn't as if there weren't others to undertake it lesbia willoughby says that the ladies of the regiment are quite ready to divide it amongst themselves in fact they've rather resented having it so completely taken out of their hands mother you had better understand me at once and for all nothing will induce me to give up any single item of all that i've undertaken but char why inquired captain trevellyan mildly is it the work you care about or just the fact of doing it yourself dead silence followed the inquiry at last char said without attempting to answer it the hostile suggestion is quite impossible mother even if it were not for the practical objections such as the distance from the work i could not accept my staff has been put into perfectly suitable quarters and i should not dream of moving them but as it has become more and more evident that miss jones is dissatisfied there she paused and looked at grace trevellyan made a sudden brusque gesture but grace said quickly i am afraid that i had better ask you to accept my resignation miss vivian char made no pretence at surprise and simply bent her head in acquiescence grace folded up her work and stood up trevellyan opened the door for her and with one look at joanna passed out of the room after her miss bruce gasped as at a sudden illumination but it was joanna who exclaimed roundly well char you've put your foot into it with a vengeance unless i'm very much mistaken john will be in no hurry to forgive you mother why will you always obscure every issue of what is after all national work by some wretched personal question because char i'm dealing with human beings and not with machines oh lady vivian cried miss bruce irrepressibly forgive me but you speak as though she she wasn't adored by her staff look how they all admire her yes and she takes advantage of it to work them very much too hard and also to use her personal influence to obtain a sort of blind loyalty and perfectly unreasoning admiration that is bad for the work and bad for the staff and bad for her however char i don't mind telling you that i think a good deal of that nonsense is coming to an end your staff has not been at all impressed by your abominable treatment of that poor little superintendent and they've also found out that you insisted on going off to questerham against your father's express wishes and then posed as a martyr to patriotism oh lady vivian groaned the secretary 
yes i know i'm losing my temper but i always did and always shall think that char behaved in the most heartless and disgraceful fashion it wasn't i who told her staff about it or grace jones either but i'm heartily grateful to whoever did the work that we hear so much about may get a chance of being attended to on its own merits now in a reasonable manner instead of being overdone to a senseless degree simply because miss vivian is so wonderful joanna went to the door think it over char and if you like to behave like a reasonable being we'll talk over the hostile scheme otherwise john thinks there's no doubt of this place being accepted as a convalescent home but you'll have to make up your mind in that case to see it being mismanaged by mere military authorities joanna did not bang the door behind her but she shut it with considerable briskness and left the appalled miss bruce to assist char's decision the director of the midland supply depot sat in an attitude of the most unwonted dejection her elbows on the writing-table and her head in her hands miss bruce hardly ventured to breathe in the heavy stillness that pervaded the room at last char raised her head and looked at her oh brucey she said piteously they're all very difficult to deal with the note of appeal which miss bruce had not heard from char since her earliest childhood moved the little secretary to great emotion charming my poor dear child it's very hard on you after all you've been through already i know that dear lady vivian has never altogether understood and then her feelings about the war so different only of course now she needn't consider circumstances altered reaction miss bruce floundered into a tangle of words and ventured to put out her hand timidly although aware of how much char disliked demonstrations of affection it affected her with a profound sense of how far miss vivian must be reduced when she found her tentative hand received with a long nervous pressure oh what can i do what can i say couldn't you make up your mind to this hostile scheme which would at least keep you at home i'm not thinking of myself though of course it's quite true that if plessing becomes a convalescent home under military ruling i can't go on living here nothing would induce me to remain in a place where i had no official standing my mother doesn't seem to consider that she's practically forcing me to go on living under most uncomfortable conditions in questerham not added char hastily recollecting herself that i should dream of putting any personal consideration before the work or of letting my own comfort interfere with it in any way i know i know it's wonderful the way you've never thought of yourself for a moment cried miss bruce in all sincerity even to your meals for i know too well that half the time you never have any proper lunch at all and your dinner at all hours but i'm so dreadfully afraid of your breaking down not while there's work to be done brucey but this winter has been appalling with one thing and another father and then all the difficulties here and half the staff getting laid up with influenza before christmas they're few enough as it is for all they have to do and now i suppose half of them will resign impossible not at all impossible with miss jones making mischief and talking all over the place about my private affairs and then resigning in that absurd way no doubt that will be made into a grievance too i thought began miss bruce and then hesitated but char looked so impatient that she went on rather desperately i thought that you meant to send her away in any case certainly i did you must see brucey how utterly out of the question it would be to have one member of the staff a sort of privileged person who'd been out here to stay when none of the others have so much as set foot in the place and talking about my relations as though they were intimate friends of hers it would be quite impossible if miss bruce saw the impossibility in question less clearly than did char she said nothing no brucey it's no good i've set my hand to the plough and there must be no looking back i shall have to make up my mind to question him but the discomfort 
wailed miss bruce it may convince my mother that there is more than mere self-will and love of notoriety in my work to me brucey it seems almost laughable that any one should attribute my work to that sort of motive but you see she has never understood me never said miss bruce with entire conviction the wrench will be leaving you dear old brucey char said affectionately charming said the little secretary solemnly i can't do it i can't face letting you go alone to those horrible lodgings and only preston to see to your comfort i don't wish to say a word against preston and i know how devoted she is to you but there are things that she can't be expected to think of if you leave plessing you must take me with you an emotion such as had never shaken miss vivian out of her self-possession before moved her suddenly now do you really mean that brucey would you leave my mother and the work which she would certainly find for you here and come and look after me in questerham i do know that i'm difficult sometimes and and i can't promise you always to come in punctually to dinner but it would make all the difference in the world to have you there miss bruce's allegiance to char dated from many years back and needed no strengthening was indeed beyond it but henceforward come what might she would never forget that miss vivian had said that it made all the difference in the world to have her there i will come whenever you like and wherever you go and i will look after you as much as you'll let me she said tearfully there was a silence before char remarked practically you'll have to arrange it with my mother brucey i don't want her to think that you're deserting her for me it was difficult to see how lady vivian could possibly think anything else but the uplifted miss bruce knew no qualms of spirit i'll tell her myself dear and i know she'll understand she'll be only too glad that you should have somebody with you indeed she does care very very much if you'll let me say so but all that's past has i know i know it all makes it the more impossible for me to stay here with her and at the same time try to carry on the work then you won't consider the idea of making this place into a hostel i've already said that it's out of the question quite evidently the director of the midland supply depot was herself again she rose and was meekly followed by miss bruce into the hall where sat lady vivian and captain trevellyan mother i'm going to bed said char calmly with regard to your scheme of making this place into a hostel by the way i'm afraid it wouldn't answer i'm most grateful to you but as director of the midland supply depot i must refuse the offer joanna shrugged her shoulders then my dear as director of the midland supply depot i'm afraid you must go on living uncomfortably in rooms since i suppose you won't want to stay here when the place is full of convalescent soldiers not in the circumstances said char gravely miss bruce advanced valiantly i have told miss vivian that i'm quite sure that you you will see your way to letting me go and be of what use i can to her in questerham lady vivian leave plessing lady vivian's voice held surprise only but the unfortunate miss bruce was again obliged to struggle with divided feelings she gazed miserably round but captain trevellyan returned her look with one of unmistakable reproach and char was fixing her eyes persistently upon the fire and then reassurance came to her from joanna's voice unusually gentle i'm very glad dear miss bruce i shall like to feel that someone is looking after char who has known her all her life and cared for her as you have and you won't be far away so that i shan't feel i've lost sight of you you must come out and see me struggling with my convalescence she stretched out her left hand and miss bruce answering her smile only with a convulsive pressure and a sort of sob compounded of mingled relief gratitude and compunction hurried upstairs with her handkerchief undisguisedly held to her eyes poor miss bruce we shall make an exchange char said her mother for i'm hoping that grace will stay here and help me in what capacity any capacity she likes i hope said char 
in tones which held more of doubt than of hopefulness that you will find her more accurate than i have good night she went upstairs in her turn feeling oddly tired and with a disquieting sense of finality her way and her mother's had parted and although char knew little regret for a separation which had long held them apart in all but physical nearness she felt to the full the disturbing element introduced by a definitely spoken renunciation she would return to her work on the morrow and make the move from plessing as speedily as might be but even in thinking of her work char felt that evening no solace for the recollection of her mother's words as to the frame of mind in which the staff might receive her left her strangely bereft of her usual armour of self-confidence in the hall trevellyan asked joanna rather wistfully do you mind very much exchanging miss bruce for grace do you think i shall lose by it they both laughed a little and then trevellyan looking into the fire observed i'm glad you're going to have her i shall like thinking that she's working with you here i'm glad johnny there was a ghost of a flicker in joanna's voice she'll be a comfort to you yes indeed she will the difference of age hasn't prevented our being friends and and you'll look after her i hope so at all events i shan't allow her to do any nursing of wounded since we know the unfortunate effect that the sight of blood has upon her joanna was laughing outright now oh did she tell you yes i think that was the first time she and i ever had any real conversation was it it was rather talented of you in the circumstances cousin joanna yes john captain trevellyan bent a yet more ardent scrutiny upon the fire it seems the wrong time to say anything about it but you always understand and she and i could neither of us that you shouldn't know it at once i couldn't go away without telling you not said johnny suddenly turning round and facing her that anything is settled you know except the only thing that matters said joanna softly one thing that makes us both care so much he said diffidently is that we both care so much for you she gave him both hands regally and he stooped and kissed them as he might have a queen's presently she said i'm so glad dear johnny nothing in the world can make me happier it was past eleven o'clock before john left her and his final inquiry standing at the hall door made her laugh outright you don't think any one will guess do you she doesn't want anything said till her father knows and unluckily i can't get down to wales and see him now there won't be time but you didn't guess till i told you did you my dear johnny said joanna with a singular absence of any emotion but her habitual kindly satire in her voice you really remind me very much sometimes of an ostrich End of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen of the war workers by e m delafield this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt perard chapter nineteen grace jones went back to the hostel soon after the new year in order to pack up and to make her farewells before going for a month's holiday to her home in wales and then plessing said miss marsh in an awed voice and then plessing grace assented lady vivian hopes that it will be properly started by that time as a convalescent home she looked across the sitting-room to where mrs bullivant was sitting with a smile that held inquiry and congratulation fancy ejaculated mrs bullivant with a sort of timorous pleasure lady vivian actually thought of me and suggested my taking over the work of quartermistress there you know looking after the stores and all that sort of thing i must say it's very good of her and i shall like working there and gracie as secretary and all too it'll be quite like old times i hate changes observed miss henderson gloomily this place will be extraordinary with you gone mrs bullivant and gracie and probably tony and plumtree as well 
Tony isn't leaving, is she? cried Grace. Yes, she is. Sent in her resignation two days ago. The fact is, she was altogether upset by that fuss we had about Miss Vivian the other day, and so she's decided that she wants a change, and Greengage says she won't stay without her. They always did hang together, you know. I don't altogether wonder at poor old Plumtree, Mrs. Potter observed thoughtfully. Miss Vivian has always had a down on her, hasn't she? But she and Tony will be a loss to the hostel, and so will you, dear. I don't like leaving a bit, Grace declared. You've all been so nice to me, and I've been very happy here. It was undeniable, however, that happiness was not destined to be the prevailing characteristic of Miss Jones' last day in the office. Miss Vivian, seated at her paper-strewn table with all the old arrogance, if not actually with an additional touch of it to counteract the humanizing effect of the crepe morning band on her left arm, ignored her junior secretary as far as possible, but inspected her work with a closeness of attention that almost argued a desire to find it defective. You can hand over your work to Miss Delmege, Miss, er, Jones. She will take it over on Monday next. Yes, Miss Vivian. And bring me your files. Char ran over the papers in the old way, with a murmured running commentary that denoted her utter unconsciousness of all but the task in hand, and at the same time made the extensive area covered by her official correspondence fully evident to the perceptions of whoever might be in the room with her. Papers relating to that man farmer's pension. Those must go up today. That contract for the milk. Send it up to the commissariat department, and I should like to know why they haven't sent me down the balance sheets for the month. Nothing is ever properly checked, it seems to me, unless I do it myself, though heaven only knows when I'm to find time for it. I've got to go through the accounts today, sometime or other. What's this? One of the nurses from the town hospital wants to see me, and calmly writes to say so. I never heard such unofficial nonsense in my life, as though I had time to give personal interviews to every wretched little V.A.D. who chooses to ask for them. Miss Domege? Yes, Miss Vivian. Take this letter and answer it in the third person. Make it quite clear that any application of that sort is entirely out of order. If she wants to speak to anyone, she can go to Matron and... If it's necessary, Matron can write to me about it. Miss Delmege took the letter and mentally framed to herself the sentences in which she would later on make it clear to Gracie Jones that Miss Vivian's manner never really meant anything and that her summary dismissal of any such appeal was only the necessary concomitant to official authority. It had become increasingly clear to Miss Delmege that Gracie was somehow, by the very reticence of her unspoken judgments, at the bottom of the extraordinary prejudice with which so many members of the staff now viewed the arbitrary ways of Miss Vivian. The clear, rapid undertones continued. Boiler at the hospital burst. They should have reported it sooner, but I'll send an order to the shop people. Another list for transfer. Dr. Prince transfers his men without rhyme or reason. All cases of myalgia and trench feet, too. I shall have to write and tell him to reconsider half of them before I should dream of letting them leave. What's all that? Case for massage, case for shepherd's bush, five transfers for convalescent homes. Send me up the transport officer, Miss Delmege. What are my appointments for today? The new superintendent for the hostel is coming for an interview at two o'clock, and Dr. Prince rang up to say that he would come in for a moment at three. Char raised her eyebrows. If I happen to be engaged or busy, he will have to wait. Is that all? Yes, Miss Vivian. Thank heaven, piously ejaculated Char, entirely pour la forme since the interviews which cut into her day's work afforded her the only relief she obtained from its monotonous strain then i'll get through these letters at once send those to mrs potter and miss domage you can take these 
the rest are for the clothing department miss jones kindly deal with these files send for miss call mrs baker bridges to take down some letters at once miss delmege looked rather disturbed and remained standing at char's elbow without speaking miss vivian as was customary with her when wishing to display absorption in her work continued to turn over the papers on the table without raising her eyes at last she looked up and said sharply what is it miss delmege you fidget me very much by standing there in that unmeaning way do you want anything miss delmege cleared her throat nervously too well did she know the peculiar note of crisp asperity now sounding in her chief's voice i'm afraid the stenographer isn't here to-day and why on earth not she isn't well i've had no application for sick leave she only telephoned this morning to say that she didn't feel able to come to-day char with the calculated show of temper with which she greeted any departures from discipline struck the table with her hand and made the unfortunate miss delmege jump i think you've all lost your heads completely while i've been away is this office under military discipline or is it not the question being purely rhetorical miss delmege attempted no reply to it and merely drooped the more dejectedly over her sheaf of letters you can tell miss collins that unless she can apply for sick leave in the proper manner and with a medical certificate to say that she is unfit for duty she may consider herself dismissed miss delmege only too thankful to feel that the director's wrath was not aimed at herself hastened to the telephone to deliver the ultimatum she returned scarlet and with an air of outraged modesty that made grace look at her in mild astonishment miss jones curiosity however only received satisfaction that afternoon at the close of dr prince's interview with miss vivian when he casually remarked by the way that pretty little red-haired typist of yours the one who got married the other day paid me a call yesterday then perhaps you can inform me why she thought proper to remain away from duty without leave to-day oh you'll have her back to-morrow for a time anyway grace saw miss delmege make a hurried plunge into a small stationary cupboard where she appeared to be searching for something elaborately concealed i can't help that sort of playing fast and loose with the work char said icily if miss collins mrs baker bridges the doctor corrected her cheerfully if my stenographer can't attend to her work regularly she is of very little use to me she's probably going to be of more use to the nation let me tell you than all the rest of you put together said dr prince mrs delmege's agony of mind reached its culmination and she let drop an armful of heavy ledgers with a clatter which effectually covered any further in delicate precision of utterance of which the doctor might have been guilty by the time that grace had extinguished her own laughter in the cupboard and had assisted miss delmege to pick up her books the doctor had slammed the door behind him with a disregard for miss vivian's presence which might perhaps be accounted for by the searching cross-examination to which she had just subjected his proposed medical board cases a doctor's profession i suppose miss delmere said to grace in tones of outraged delicacy as they left the office together destroys the finer feelings altogether i'm not prudish so far as i know but really after what passed in the office to-day i wish you'd tell me what mrs baker bridges said to you over the telephone miss delmege colored and tossed her head some people don't seem to mind what they say i never did like her but i certainly didn't think she had a coarse mind and has she well i wouldn't say it to any one but you dear and i know you won't repeat any of it but she was actually so pleased and proud at the mere idea that she said she couldn't keep it to herself though she isn't even in the least certain 
the virtuous horror expressed in miss delmege's whole person at such deplorable outspokenness was so excessive that grace dared not make any reply for fear of producing an anticlimax that evening grace's last at questerham hostel her roommate became disconsolate i don't know what i shall do without you gracie and this room will be simply awful you've always been such a dear about my being so untidy and everything and put up with all of it and done such heaps of little things i shall never forget how you washed up the cups and tea things after our morning tea dear never but i was only too pleased protested grace you've done a lot for me if it comes to that look how often you've boiled your kettle for me and had everything ready on nights when i came back late i shall miss you very much but don't forget that if ever you're in wales you're coming to stay with us i say do you really mean that of course i do you are a brick gracie the thing i like about you said miss marsh instructively is that you don't put on any frills well why should i oh i don't know staying at plessing and knowing miss vivian's people and so on there are others i could name miss marsh said viciously who take airs for a good deal less in fact for nothing at all that any one but themselves can see miss jones knew from much previous experience the subject denoted by that particular edge in her roommate's voice are you worried she asked sympathetically selecting a euphemism at random my dear i've got an awful fear that delmege means to move into this room when you're gone you'll see if she doesn't get round the new superintendent she's always resented being put in with two others and that room of theirs will always be a three-bedded one but tony and miss plumtree are both leaving not yet and anyway two others will be put in instead mark my words said miss marsh tragically that'll be the next thing delmege and me stuck in here tete -tete, as they say i do hope not i shall resign that's all simply resign and give my reasons i shall say to miss vivian right out when she asks me why i want to leave but she never does ask why any one wants to leave besides you know you wouldn't leave for such a ridiculous reason as that well perhaps i wouldn't after all i should be sorry to think i couldn't get the better of delmege when all said and done i've a very good mind to tell her quite plainly that if she's got her eye on that corner bed she'll have to come to an understanding with me first both as to the use of the screen and who's to make tea in the morning and turn the gas out at night i've heard tales about delmege's trick of getting into bed in a hurry and leaving everybody else to do the work and she and i have had words before now i know you have said grace perhaps that may prevent her from wanting to come here miss marsh looked gloomy and then bounded up as a tap sounded on the door what did i tell you i'll take any bet you like that's delmege nosing round now i know the way she swishes her petticoat such swank wearing a silk one under uniform well i'm not going to interfere with her miss marsh bounced behind her screen come in grace called say i'm undressing miss marsh issued a whispered command miss delmege stepped elegantly into the room her favorite fawn peignoir chastely gathered round her you alone dear no she isn't i'm undressing she said a sharp voice behind the screen miss delmege ignored the voice and laid a patronizingly affectionate hand upon grace's shoulder what thick hair you have dear quite a work brushing it i should think now mine is so long that it's never had time to get really thick though i know you wouldn't guess it to look at it but that's the way it grows as a child i used to have a perfect mass mother always used to say about me that child vera's strength has all gone into her hair every bit of it it used to make her quite anxious to see me without a bit of colour in my face and this great mass of hair what made it all fall out delmege came incisively from behind the screen 
miss delmege tossed the long attenuated plait of straight fair hair which hung artlessly over one shoulder and simulated deafness i just looked in as it's your last night here she told grace we shall miss you i'm sure tell me dear have you any idea who is coming into this room in your place not any hastily said grace as miss marsh's boot was dropped on the floor with a clatter that argued a certain degree of energy in removing it i suppose it will be arranged by the new superintendent it might be kinder said miss delmege thoughtfully to have all that sort of thing in order before she arrives she'll have plenty to do without changes of bedroom but of course this is a room for two there's no doubt about it i've sometimes thought of a move myself and this might be a good opportunity the second boot was violently sent to rejoin its fellow strange the noise that goes on in here isn't it with only the pair of you too i wonder it doesn't disturb you but perhaps you're used to it if you don't like noise delmege don't come in here exclaimed the still invisible miss marsh i never could bear creeping about without a sound like a cat myself i dare say not miss delmege returned with a certain spurious assumption of extreme gentleness in her little refined enunciation but i hope we all know what give and take is in sharing a room especially in war time there's more take than give about some of us by all accounts especially in the matter of kettles and early tea was the retort of miss marsh spoken with asperity miss delmege turned to grace well dear as i don't propose to have words either now or at any other hour i shall say good-night do you mean to say you manage with only one screen quite well besides there are two round the other bed i dare say that's very necessary said miss delmege pointedly as she moved to the door good-night dear good-night said grace not without thankfulness good-night repeated miss delmege to the screen when i'm in here i shall certainly insist upon having an extra screen i can't imagine how anybody can manage with one only and each will keep to her own side of the room too instead of leaving her things all over the others what i call untidy some of these arrangements are but of course it's all what one's been used to isn't it leaving no time for a reply to this favorite inquiry miss delmege shut the door gently behind her grace proceeding to bed under the flow of eloquence directed at her from behind miss marsh's screen conjectured that the bedroom would know no lack of spirited conversation between its inmates in the future the next morning miss marsh asked her at breakfast shall you go and say good-bye to miss vivian i don't think it's necessary is it grace said hesitatingly i can easily find out for you dear if she can see you for a moment miss delmege kindly volunteered the opinion of the hostel instantly veered round to an irrevocable certainty that a farewell to miss vivian was not necessary after all she'd only say she was too busy to see you or say she couldn't conscientiously recommend you for clerical work as she did to poor plumtree when she gave in her resignation the other day after plumtree has toiled over those beastly averages for the best part of two years it was evident that the temper of the staff for one reason or another was undergoing a very thorough reaction indeed only miss delmege remarked firmly i know nothing about plumtree's work i'm sure but if there's one thing miss vivian is it's just quite impartially speaking one can't help seeing that and especially being as i am in the position of her secretary as i always say i get at the human side of her inhuman i call it muttered tony miss plumtree's chief ally wherever a recommendation is possible miss vivian always gives it inflexibly replied miss delmege i can answer for that few things received less consideration in the hostel than miss delmege in process of answering for the director of the midland supply depot and miss marsh 
tony and miss henderson dashed simultaneously into discussion of a project for seeing grace off at the station we can get off at lunchtime and your train goes at one thirty doesn't it gracie yes and i'd love you to come only what about your lunch but everyone said that didn't matter at all and that of course dear old gracie must have a proper send-off how nice they all are to me thought grace and recklessly purchased a supply of cigarettes which she left with mrs bullivant for the consolation of the hostel during many sunday afternoons to come we shall meet at plessing the little superintendent said kissing her affectionately and it will be a great pleasure to work with you miss jones dear and you must tell me all lady vivian likes you know and how we can help her most you'll like working for her very much grace prophesied confidently good-bye dear mrs bullivant and thank you for all your kindness to me she ran down the steps and would not look back conscious of emotion at the station the members of the staff were to appear when possible but as grace crossed pollard street glancing involuntarily at the familiar office door miss delmege with a most unusual disregard for propriety emerged hastily hatless and with her neat coils of hair ruffled in the wind good-bye dear it's sad to lose you but i'm sure i hope you'll like your new job i must say it's been a pleasure to work with you oh i'm so glad how kind of you it's not every one i could say it to miss delmege observed with great truth but there's never been the least little difficulty has there we shall all miss you and i must say i could wish that some others i could name were leaving in your place grace knew too well the nameless being alluded to however feebly disguised by the use of the plural couldn't you get away to the station she asked hastily well dear i would but really with so many others there to tell you the truth that miss marsh is beginning to get on my nerves a bit besides you see if i went off early miss vivian might think it rather strange on this unanswerable reason grace took a cordial farewell of miss vivian's unalterably loyal remaining secretary at the station tony and mrs potter hailed her eagerly we got down early but the others are coming there's an awful crowd dear better hurry grace in obedience to their urgings purchased her ticket while mrs potter looked after the luggage and tony took possession for her of a corner seat facing the engine here you are and remember said mrs potter earnestly that you can get a cup of nice hot tea at the junction there'll be plenty of time i found out on purpose thank you very much said grace gratefully she stood at the window and presently tony and mrs potter were joined by several other members of the staff all hurried but eager to take an affectionate farewell of gracie marsh ought to be here can't think why she isn't she was tearing about like mad so as to get off in time said miss plumtree that girl will come into heaven late miss henderson prophesied and looked gratified when her neighbor emitted a faint shocked exclamation give her my love if she's too late and say i'm so very sorry said grace you'll be off in a minute now mind you come back next month all right we'll come down and meet you i should like that so much i shall look out on this very platform for you all oh gracie shall we any of us ever see this awful platform without thinking of those troop trains and the ghastly weight of the trays never said grace with entire conviction there's the whistle you're off now and here's marsh she'll just do it look at her grace hung out of the window and saw the ever tardy miss marsh hastening up the crowded platform making free use of her elbows i started too late that wretched delmege pretended i was wanted so sorry gracie dear mind you write yes yes and please do all right to me when you have time and tell me all your news and we'll meet again next month as soon as i get back the train was moving now and only the panting and energetic miss marsh hastened along beside it her hand on the carriage window good-bye good luck i shall miss you dreadfully in our room don't be surprised 
if you hear that delmege and i have had words together that girl simply gets on my nerves stand back there please good-bye gracie good-bye grace stood at the window and waved to the little group until the blue uniforms were lost to sight and only the flutter of tony's handkerchief was still visible the hostile days were over but she would remember them always with a smile for the small hardships that had been tempered by so much kindness and merriment and with a faithful recollection of the good companionship that work and the comradeship of workers ever had brought her to john trevelyan in the trenches grace wrote something of her thoughts two days later amid much else i'm so glad i went to questerham apart from everything else for the experience the hostile life was sometimes uncomfortable but it was always amusing and when all was said and done everybody was ready to do anything or everything for anyone else i can't believe i was only there such a little while for more happened to me there and i got into realer touch with more people than ever before and now the new year is only just beginning and there have been so many changes and happenings already i wonder so much what else it is going to bring to all of us who were together in Crestram. End of chapter 19。The War Workers by E. M. Delafield. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter 20. To Grace Jones herself, the new year, speeding on its way until it was new no longer, brought much work in the convalescent home at Plessing. The glad realization of Joanna Vivian's need of her and innumerable unstamped letters bearing the field postmark the quality of miss joan's peculiar philosophy was much tested as the months went by but it was characteristic of her to be much heartened and rejoiced by an announcement confided to her soon after her return by miss marsh the boy i was such pals with has been sent back on sick leave and they're not sending him out again and if you'll believe me dear i've been persuaded into saying yes he wants it to be quite soon and really i don't mind if it is the hostel is quite changed nowadays and not nearly as jolly as it was now the new superintendent makes us all so comfortable besides i don't mind telling you between ourselves gracie that i can't help fancying me going off like that and coming back with a wedding ring and all will be rather a knock in the eye for our old friend delmege if this kindly prognostication was verified, Miss Delmege gave no sign of it, beyond introducing several additional shades of superiority into the manner of her congratulations. Strange, isn't it, she observed with a small and tight smile, to see the way some people put all sorts of personal considerations first and the work afterwards. Personally, I agree with Miss Vivian on the subject in agreement with miss vivian on that as on all else miss delmege continued to find solace the promotion of miss bruce to grace jones vacant place in miss vivian's office was a source of disquiet to her for some time but the bond of a common admiration at last asserted itself and found expression in their united efforts to persuade miss vivian to her lunch every day there was also infinite consolation to miss delmege in her assertions frequently heard at the hostel that nowhere was the human side of the director of the midland supply depot so touchingly and unmistakably shown as in the occasional unofficial lapses which led her to address her secretary as brucey the hostel saw rapid changes when tony and miss plumtree had both become munition workers and miss bullivant had gone to plessing the war workers became the victims of a series of new superintendents each of whom found insuperable difficulty in accommodating herself to the arbitrary ruling of miss vivian and either departed summarily or received a curt dismissal finally an energetic scotswoman 
established herself at the hostel and as miss vivian had become exceedingly weary of the quest remained there unchallenged she was a better manager than little mrs bullivant and made drastic reformations in many directions several of which were ungratefully received by the older members of the community for i must say mrs potter told miss henderson it was a good deal more sociable in the old days when we made toast for tea over the sitting-room fire on sunday afternoons and dr prince dropped in and told us all the news it was tony and miss plumtree who dropped in now and did their best to bridge the gulf that had yawned so long between the munition workers hostel and that sacred to miss vivian's clerical staff it's all very well miss plumtree instructively remarked as she lounged in holland overalls and a pair of baggy but entirely unmistakable garments from which miss domege kept her eyes studiously averted it's all very well but working at munitions gives one a bit of an idea as to what one's working for you people may think it's all miss vivian's personality etc etc but i can tell you that's a jolly small part of the whole show the independence of miss plumtree's manner as well as a new and strange slanginess developed both by her and by little miss anthony was noted by their old companions without enthusiasm after all tony chimed in patronizingly you really have the best of it troop trains simply aren't in it with our work standing all day long and shifts of twelve hours at a time and if you turn green that little reptile of a welfare superintendent pouring water all over you and telling you that there's nothing the matter a shade of reminiscence almost of regret passed over her face at all events miss vivian never did that and she was pretty to look at every one is hideous at the works especially jawbones and who mrs potter distantly inquired is jawbones her tone implied that there were nicknames and nicknames and that those in use among the habitues of the munitions factory would meet with little or no admiration from the refined inhabitants of the hostel that's what we call the superintendent tony said airily miss delmege her lips drawn into an extremely thin line uttered her solitary contribution to the conversation before retiring with marked aloofness to the bedroom where she hoped to defeat her old antagonist miss marsh by annexing all three screens and the largest kettle of hot water i must say it does seem to me that a happy medium might be found between doing your war work entirely for the sake of whoever's at the head of it and calling your superintendent jawbones the conclusion was so irrefutable that even the newborn independence acquired by the munition makers could produce no adequate reply it might even be inferred from the unusual thoughtfulness with which the holland clad enthusiasts took their departure that neither was devoid of an occasional pang at the memory of the old days of blind obedience and enthusiastic loyalty to the ideal which char vivian with all her autocratic charm and occasional flashes of kindness still represented as dr prince had said the vivians of plessing stood for the highest in the land the doctor seldom came to the hostel now for time had brought him more work than ever and he spared himself none of it only at plessing could he sometimes be persuaded to spend half an hour in talking to grace or lady vivian after his medical inspection was over a wonderful work you're doing here he told joanna with satisfaction i wish all our great houses could be turned to such good use and all our lady workers too added the doctor with some significance when all said and done nursing is women's work and no one else's and the ruling of hospital discipline and the disposal of cases for medical boards or anything else ought to be left to the medical officer that's my opinion right or wrong and will be till my dying day to joanna vivian presiding over the altered establishment at plessing 
time brought many outlets for the unquenchable spirit of energy that would always possess her she brought gaiety to her work and laughter that was as unofficial as her inveterate habit of referring all questions of discipline to dr prince and the management of each individual branch to the helper in charge of it joanna's staff was not a large one and each member of it had her own special and peculiar interest in the work given into her hands it was in vain that lesbia willoughby from london wrote impassioned accounts to her poor dear joanna of the many activities in which her days and nights appeared to fly past wounded colonials blinded officers flag days hospitals canteens red cross entertainments i have my finger in every single war pie that's going and i can't tell you how too utterly twee some of the dear fellows are with whom i get into touch if you only trust that sulky girl of yours to me for six months i can do wonders for her and probably get her off your hands altogether after all dear we can never forget that you and i were girls together can we lesbia never means to forget it that's clear enough was the sole comment of lady vivian she did not go through the form of transferring mrs willoughby's invitation to her daughter it gradually became evident that the director of the midland supply depot would accord but little of her fully occupied time to a convalescent home not supplied from her own depot and as joanna said to grace with her habitual slight shrug it may be just as well my dear i'm not miss bruce and char and i haven't the same way of looking at things she vexed and disappointed her father and no amount of eloquence about her high and mighty motives will ever make me altogether forget it i shall never be able to hear her talk about her position as director of the midland supply depot without thinking what a fool i was not to smack her well when she was a child thus joanna half laughing but with the eternal loneliness that all john's steadfast loyalty and grace's loving companionship would never altogether assuage still underlying the dauntless youthfulness in her blue eyes for trevelyan the months succeeded one another strangely monotonous in company with a hundred thousand others somewhere in france he moved between the mud and noise and blood in the trenches and the eternal dreary billets where letters from home and the need of sleep were the only considerations but to his grace in england johnny wrote cheerfully of hope and good courage and peace dawning on a far horizon and of the prospect of ten days leave to char vivian director of the midland supply depot the advancing year imperceptibly enough brought certain solutions and enlightenments the personal fascination that she could exert when she willed would always secure for her a following of blindly devoted adherents but her influence was not always strong enough to retain their admiration insensibly char modified a little of her arbitrariness they put so much else before the work she said helplessly to miss bruce but char's perceptions were never lacking in acumen and she became more and more aware of the truth of joanna's prognostication that the work of the supply depot would be done for its own sake and for that of the cause in whose name it existed and it was perhaps that awareness which brought to her a gradual realization of motives in her own self-devotion hitherto unacknowledged to herself the director of the midland supply depot might sit day after day and hour after hour at her paper-strewn table issuing orders and receiving the official interviews and communications that so clearly indicated the high responsibility of her position but char vivian grew to exercise a certain discretion in the matter of her return to the meals and rest so anxiously watched over by miss bruce whose adoring loyalty was hers beyond any possibility of shaking in those occasional unofficial concessions to her imploring solitude might after all be numbered 
the most creditable achievements of miss vivian london 1917 the end end of chapter 20 end of the war workers by e m delafield